talk about the obvious, what a care is and a burden. Because we all say casting our cares. But sometimes, I don't know about you guys, but growing up in the church, there's a lot of verses that I just know because I've heard them so much. And like Jen would say, they almost sound like wah, 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 wah sometimes. Until meditation really is helpful for that because then I really get to focus on a phrase or a word. And so it's kind of what I've done with this verse over the course of a couple months and then over um, figuring out what the Lord wanted to share with us tonight. So obviously we all have cares. We all at least have one. And sometimes they're not our own, right? Do you guys ever carry somebody else's cares mm -hmm. and burdens? Mm -hmm. I feel like probably 50% of what I carry is somebody else's cares and burdens. They're not all mine. And I think that that's, um, when we do it in the right way, it's a beautiful thing. That's why we're, what we're supposed to do. Um, but what is a care or a burden? What, what affects you might not affect me, right? What I might pick up as a care, you might be like, why are you even worried about that? I don't know, I've had so many, like our personalities are so unique that sometimes I just think everybody cares the same way I do until I run into somebody that's like, what do you mean you worry about that? You, that's a fear or whatever word you want to say. And it's like, oh, well, I guess that is that is something that I find as a burden. So I think that that's interesting. Like, it really makes me have to listen and try to understand somebody or else I'm going to just think that, you know, um, judge them or just think that they're being not, I don't want to use bad words, stupid. <laughs> Stupid in their word, like more, like worse than stupid. I don't want to call anybody stupid. But um, what do what do we tend to do with our cares? What are some things, some things where you guys get stuck with your cares? Like, do you want me to give you an example of what I do? I think about them over and over and over. I call it spinning. I get stuck on something and it spins, and then I create things that aren't true in them. I'll make up a story and all the what ifs until it's spinning and it's bigger than it really is. That's one thing I do. What about you, Jen? Yeah. Mom. I'm aware of it more if I wake up at night and can't get back to sleep. And I've learned to pray and really, you know. Try so to your cares stuff. wake you up. They can wake you have... up. And 90% and of what we worry about doesn't usually even come true. Like we do, we go into a spin. And yeah. We start thinking of all these things that could happen, and blah blah blah. And, it's like, so and some crazy. people, I just was thinking of um, Edwin. Like some of, like he physically manifests some things in his health wise when he's when he was carrying a specific burden in his life. Like so that sometimes happens to us. Stress starts to affect our bodies and. High blood pressure. Yeah. Anything, does anybody else do anything like when they get a care or a burden? Another thing I do is I numb out. I, I tend to numb out because I don't want to think about it anymore. So I will go get involved in TV or a book or my phone or something. Anybody else do anything like that? Yep. I'm glad. Sleep. Yeah. I was thinking about that. Yeah. And then let's even go to the extremes of eating. drugs, alcohol, mm -hmm. like severe numbing things and eating. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that we do when a care or a burden comes. And mm -hmm. they all, they're always coming. The Lord promised we'd have troubles, but he also gave us promises to how to deal with those troubles and those mm -hmm. cares. And so I want... Let's, let's make a quick list of some cares, some generic cares, just so we're all in kind of agreement of what some cares could be. Finances. Finances. Yeah. <laughs> Money. Health. Our 
silver and gray and silver. Family? Family. Can I just put it under that? Unsafe. Unsafe. Yeah. Mr. Day is our country, where we're headed. Right. We put that under the category of unknowns. Unknowns. Yeah. Unknowns are, is a big one for me. Mm -hmm. Our jobs, our work.
coming down to the wire feeling. Like, this isn't happening. Not one fish came in that, those nets. And when warning comes, they're, they're like, defeated. Well, this is it. I, maybe, maybe I can steal away in a, in a merchant's cart and just go around the Romans, or maybe I'll just say goodbye to my wife and then I'll be in prison, I guess. And on the shore is Jesus talking, teaching and talking to, to um, the crowd. And they pull in and then the whole exchange of um, Andrew knows who he is because John the baptizer is, talked about him and he's like, Peter, this is the guy I'm telling you about. And he's like, whatever, Andrew. And Jesus this gets in the boat, talks to the crowd, and then turns to Peter, and he says, will you cast your net over the side one more time? And he's like, dude, I've done this all night. There's no fish in here. Are you nuts? And Jesus just stands there and smiles at Peter. Like, doesn't say anything else. He just smiles at him. <laughs> and, and to cast a net, you need, like, your whole, both hands. You need your whole body. It's like a whole body motion. And he throws that net, and we all know the end of the story. So much fish that they need both boats to, to fill up the fish, to fill the fish into the boats. And Peter then is like, who are you? And I want to follow you to Jesus. And I just got caught in that way that Jesus was just like, just right. do it. Yeah. Cast it. And then he was just confident. But um, to watch that and to see this verse kind of come alive. And who wrote this book? Peter. So he knows what casting means. He used words he knew. He knew what casting looks like. And so sometimes we have to take our burdens and we have to cast, like forcefully give them to Jesus. And sometimes it's like, okay, self, we're going to do this. And we have to. Like, sometimes they're so heavy, we can't do it with just one hand, right? We have to take our whole self. So, I like, I really enjoy that show. I um, don't get any money for endorsing it, but just thought I'd, I, yeah, I just thought I'd tell you guys that I enjoy it. So, ways that I cast, personally, my cares, you all should know me well by now, that I like to journal. Journaling has become my outlet for the last 10 plus years. And so it's really helped me to, to like what Jill was saying, I start to write them out and then I'm, sometimes I'm like, oh, that's really what's going on. <laughs> like I thought it was this, but it ends up being this. And sometimes it's just a dump that I need to do. And so there's like people, some people like to have a really good friend that they need to call up and just, share their care with. And I do that too. But journal is usually my first way and it is my two-way journal, my two-way prayer way. It's me dump, like I could say dumpy, but just, I just am super honest with God. If I'm mad, if I'm frustrated, if I don't understand, I just tell him. And he's super, super gentle with me with that. He wants us to be honest mm -hmm. with it. And so that's one way I do, and, and I make that my prayer, but then I usually will say it out loud, too. I'll take it, and I'll just talk through it out loud, because I want to get better at the out loud part. That's Those are some ways that I cast my cares on him. Do you guys have any ways that you like to do? Maybe you like to get out in, in nature and walk, walk it out or whatever, but <laughs> walk it out? It's usually in the car for me. In the car? Yes. Whatever I need to do. <laughs> I sit and stare with them. Cry. Yell, whatever. Of course, yeah. I have to keep my eyes on the road. But, you know. This is going to sound dumb, but this the cycle of stupid is what I call it, where you get into these cycles. It For me, if I get into that, the first thing I will have to do is back up and say, have I been taking care of myself? Because typically, a lot of the stuff is irrational and trauma-based, and it, it is often a sign that I have not been taking care of my physical needs. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of self-analyze, step back and self-analyze. I, I mean, 
and it's a simple that. thing, but hydration. No. If I'm not hydrated and I start getting in my head, it's and and the fact that's why they need to keep me up at night. Yeah. And so I that I mean it doesn't mean that that's always the way. It no, is, but, but that, I don't think many people would think of that at all, and it's probably true of a lot of us. We don't relay that. Mm -hmm. We're not getting the right. We're not feeding our bodies the right things. Mm -hmm. Getting enough sleep. Except I don't. I don't know about you, but I remember when my kids were babies and I wasn't sleeping, and everything seemed so much bigger than it really was, mm -hmm. especially in the middle of the night. I think and then you'd wake up and you'd be like, "Oh, I'm so so drama about that." Yeah, I, th I think we're a, a, a gener generations of people that just want to. We want to fill it, fix everything. You know, and it's like, that's yeah, as vacant as that, like, you know, have to learn to take care of yourself. There is a, I mean, you know, you ask for this and that, but you're not even being obedient right. with the simple things in life. Like, like you said, drinking water, or feeding your body, what you know, mostly, most of the time, what you know it really will operate the best on. So when things, when things happen, when there's been a long-term burden, like what, what should be our first response? We all know the answer, right? Let go. <clears throat> Take it to, let, who are we letting it go to? We're casting it to, to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I've got, over the years, I've gotten better at this, but there are still things that I get days into and I'm like, wait. Did I even stop to like ask you, God, what you are saying about this, what you want to do? Like, mm -hmm. did I even stop and, and give this to you yet? Am I holding this? Am I thinking that I can just do it on my own? And so my little plug of, of prayer that we learn a lot here is our praying heaven to earth, you know, like not... Like, we get stuck into lists sometimes. Sometimes I even go back to list prayer, list praying. Like, there's this care of God and this care of God. And I don't think that those things are wrong to, to talk to the Lord about what's on my list. But it's how I'm doing it. It's stopping and being like, okay, this is going on. I want to look at, to heaven and see what you're saying and what you are doing. And, and bring back to my, pro to my problem. Or bring you down to my problem. And so those kind of things have helped me. And it's, they look different to everybody. Even our four points of prayer, like we talk here, number, first one is starting our heart, like connecting with Jesus. We want to connect with him. We want to feel, have the feelings and, and have that moment, those moments with him. And then the second one, I always get the two and three mixed up, so help me out. The second one is look to see. Yes, I got it right. Look to see. So that's when we want to look to see what God is saying about that, about what we're bringing to him. And then the third one is we want to to stop. Look to see, stop to listen. Stop to listen is just, I want to do one more time, God. Like, this is, this is a process. It may not happen all in one moment, these four steps. And then the last one's agreeing with him about what to do. And that's what prayer is. Like talking, having a conversation with God about our cares is prayer. All, all those steps. And it doesn't matter if it takes you two seconds or weeks or months to get to it. It's, you know, it's prayer. All the, all the same. It reminds me of something somewhat related. When I was going through some deep inner healing, one of the things that the person that was helping with helped me ask to ask God where he was, mm -hmm. where Jesus was when that trauma was happening. Yeah. And it was so powerful that I just never experienced anything like that. Right. I can't even say how it, how it healed, but it did. Right. Because it, it, it doesn't take knowing, it doesn't take yeah. the memory away, but it adds yeah. Jesus to it. And he is yeah. and it, he's the one that changes everything. Yeah, even though you can't understand well why didn't he stop it, but there but he was there. You know? Yeah. It is so it's like, you know, you don't always understand right. how to pass. Jesus doesn't work with him with formulas. 
Yeah. It's not a formula. That's it's right. he's a person. And you just look at how he healed in the Bible. He didn't do it the same way every single time. He's he's fun like that. And that's also why I love the chosen because they made him look so fun. Yeah. They and enjoyable. Anyways, okay, so our second point is he cares for me. So we've talked about our cares and our burdens. Now we're going to talk about the fact that he cares for me. So he's not just a listening God. He's not just a hearing God. He's a jumping in God. He doesn't just want to hear about our cares. Because I feel like sometimes that's all I can do for somebody hear or care. I don't know what to do for them. I don't know how to help. I don't have the resources. I don't have whatever. But God has all of that and he's ready. He's already jumped in. He was just waiting for you to ask him to. So sometimes I feel like this is easy to believe and sometimes it's hard to believe that he cares. Do you agree with me? Like there are some things that it's easier to believe that he cares about. And then you're like, I got this, God. I know you're here for me. And then the next thing comes that you weren't prepared for. And it's almost like you forgot that God cares about your cares. And he, and he can do something about it. He's selective about what he cares about. It feels that way. It feels that way, yeah. 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 Well, I think it's, uh, you know, I fall into it all the time. And um, you're looking at it from a perspective of, cares about everything that, everything that you do and I think that we get in the way of ourselves like we say oh, why in the world would you care about this and you almost for me I neglect like well, there's no reason you should really care about this if it's not and you rationalize why you shouldn't care about it and you I mean Casey we just talked about that the other was it last week or two weeks ago or whatever and you know, we're just talking even about, you know, work stuff and her challenge me is like, you may not know what to do, but have you stopped and prayed about it? Because I know the Lord does. It's like, well, no, because in my mind, it's like, why the heck would he care about that? It's like, and, and it's almost like discrediting him of what we're telling him, what he cares about, what he doesn't, should care about, shouldn't care about. And it's, he's like, no, I care about all the things, and I have the answer for you. Just wait for you to stop and ask me if you're stressing about it and you're worrying about it, and I'm right here. Got the answer for you. Just ask it. <laughs> so it's like you, you can spend your life in this time that you don't need to spend in spinning and worrying and trying to do it on your own when the answer, like you said, just a phone call away, but Phone call away. Yeah. So. And something that I love about God is that I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I'll go with those cares and I don't hear an answer right away. Mm -hmm. I'll come back the next day and I don't hear an answer again. But it isn't about getting the response. It's about the fact that I am in the presence of a God who already knows the answer. And I can trust him for his timing on it. And that he's going to place somebody at the right time or something at the right time and position me well. And so I have to be patient. We hate timing, don't we? Mm -hmm. Like, I, like I, I know that so many people talk about how w much worse it is in our culture because everything's at our fingertips so quickly mm -hmm. that we don't know how to wait for things. True. But I think across the board, since... Since God made Adam and Eve, waiting is hard. And timing, we don't, we just don't know how to wait on God for things. And it's hard sometimes when you're watching people in pain or you're in pain about something. Um, Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Anybody know off the top of your head what that passage talks about? Yeah, the birds and the flowers, yeah. right? So this is this is God's this is Jesus's promise, and I'll I'm going to read it for you guys. 
Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen. I talk to, I self-talk myself through 30, first 34 all the time. I'm like, hey, see, we're not worried about tomorrow. Today has a lot. We're going to be in today. And I can sometimes direct my, my thoughts away from worrying about something that I have no business worrying about. And I felt like um, God brought me to this, to remember this promise in Matthew 6. Because in 1 Peter, Peter talks about, a lot about humility. And right before telling us that God cares, that Jesus cares and we can cast our cares, he talks about um the important fact of being clothed in humility with for one another and that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So I did a little deep dive into those verses with the Lord and just asking him what he was talking about and just remembering that um, he made us these promises to take care of our needs and that it's very much pride on our end when we don't believe them and we take our cares and our burdens on ourselves and decide we're, we're going to take care of them ourselves. And we do that a lot. And we do that easily because, like Josh was saying, we don't believe, we don't really think that it's that big of a matter for God to really care about. Or he didn't come, we don't think he came through for us before. Or he's been silent. Or this is still here. So how does that mean that God's taking care of my cares? There's a lot of reasons that we could give to not believe him and not believe his promise. But sometimes, this is just my opinion, we get in our way, our own way of God moving in our lives. I've been there. Well, sometimes I feel like sometimes it's we rush, we decide to make decisions and do things that are outside of the will that he had for us and all of a sudden let's say puts puts a pause and even though it's a trip a detour a, a detour it could be a short detour sometimes it is a really freaking long detour and bringing you back around to where you get to make that decision in the right way this time and you know un unfortunately that that path of redemption the redemption path that you're taking to get you back is, is a wonderful experience and seeing God's goodness through through the detour and still his faithfulness at the end to bring you right back to where you came to the beginning. Yeah. So I had this picture of what this looks like. <clears throat> and I don't know if any of you guys have ever done things alone. I'm sure you have. I used to work in x-ray and <laughs> when a complicated case would come up and it was my patient it felt really overwhelming to to deal with like through all the logistics of how I was going to get the pictures the x-rays and all the different things but when a coworker would come along and say hey Casey can I help you with that I felt like I could do anything I mean I could face any patient with my coworker, any of my coworkers, it didn't matter who. Like two is better than one in all of those situations. And for two humans to work on something, you're sharing like your own sense of knowledge and they may be bringing something and I'm bringing something. But let's bring God 
into it, who has all the knowledge and everything, like we can do, how can we, how could we not do any, you know, we can do anything. That's that idea of there's nothing that we can't do with him. So that's how, that's what I think when I think about like coming to him with my cares and then knowing he cares for me is I'm not alone anymore. With this care, like almost just flattens that spirit of isolation that wants to isolate me, that wants to make me think that I have, I'm the only one that has this, has ever had this care. Um, nobody else cares about my care. And maybe if no other human being does, God does. And He won't fail in that. And He's the one that can do anything. So here's where I want to get one more list on our board. We're going to list all the things that God can't do. Anybody got anything? Sin. Okay, I didn't think <laughs> that. I didn't think down there. Jill, you took a twist on okay. my ha-ha Okay, maybe I should rephrase my, my list. We're going to make a list of all the things God can't do for us mm. when we bring our cares to him. Oh, uh, okay. Is that better? <laughs> no. Clarification. It's all in the room. Yes. Anything? Yeah, you can't. You can't dishonor his word or his truth. Right, and I mean, he's not going to... He's like, yeah, that's he's, not going to answer our prayers about we want to be the wealthiest person in the world. Like he, he doesn't care about those kind of cares when they're when they're worldly driven. But I'm talking, let's I'm just talking simply here. Like when our cares, God can do anything. This is just an illustration. You guys are just thinking way too <laughs> way harder than I was thinking you were gonna think. There's some brains moving. Huh? I was very <laughs> No, but that's what this is where we live, right? This is it's in the details. We know that we've seen him help us with our budget, we've seen him help us with this, but when you're navigating into new areas, everything is new. Mm -hmm. And not knowing what he wants for you and what you ask for, that's where the that's where the uh is. Yeah, I'll trust him. It, it's not, it, he can do anything, yeah. but is that what he's doing? And that's that's what I think creates anxiety, because you're trying to line up what you want, or what you think is important, with what he wants. And it just seems like trying to get those two to line up are just, yeah. that's, where, that's where the anxiety is, I think. <clears throat> I, I got a thought. When you talked about Peter being a fisherman and come, like making the correlation of casting, it got me on a on a train of thought because I I fish and I fly fish and I cast and when I cast, there's an expectation. What's the expectation? I'm gonna catch something. So like we've been talking about casting our cares, but we haven't talked about like. When we cast our cares, what are we expecting? Yeah, I actually have that there. I missed it. Well, uh, what should my good. expectation be? Right, because to me, that when, if I'm casting like my fly or whatever, there's an expectation. So, like, I think the question then would be if I'm casting a care, what should I expect to catch from God? Mm -hmm. And I don't have an answer, but that's like, that's yeah, it makes me think of the yoke verse. Right? My, give me your burdens. My yoke is light. So what does that mean? I've always asked him, like, what does it mean? When you give me yours that's light, what does that mean? Well, do we even have an expectation? Or is it just like, yeah, we have a care. And it ends right there. But do we have, an, if we take that, if we take that further and apply it to what Peter's saying, because he was a fisherman, so he understood the concept and he had an expectation that when he cast his net, he was going to pull something back up. So what did Peter do when God 
when God, when Peter had the care, Jesus met his care. What was his first response? Didn't he question? I'm going to follow you. Oh, okay. After it happened. Anywhere you go, well, he, I want to follow you. He, After he cast it, he pulled it up, then he said, I'm going to follow you. He yeah. had an experience that he saw. Yeah, and the answer, I mean, that it's just an man. But, uh, I mean, I've just, my, my train of thought, though, is like, I don't know if I've ever expected anything back from God. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever thought that way. Like here, like I, more than just him taking. Yeah, care. more than just here is my care. End. Period. Like that's it. Like I don't know if I've ever in the line of casting. I don't know if I've ever expected like God. Here's my care, and my expectation is that I don't know or. I don't because know if, you want to put something. On because you. yes, yeah, the 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 mentality of a good father, like if my kids bring me one of their cares, like instantly I'm going to want to help them. Like I'm not just gonna I'm not just gonna look at them and say, oh that's sad, too bad. Yeah. But I feel like we pin that on God often. Like we know we're supposed to give him more cares. But we just bring it to him and we have no expectation that he's going to actually do anything. I, I know like that's, that's the train of thought that, I'm, that I've been going through. And I'm like, oh, okay. So here's my care. And not like a bratty child. Now what do you do about it? Yes. Not like that. But, but with a childlike expectation. With a childlike expectation. Like, all right, Papa. You like put your nut in the water or your... Yes, Jesus to Peter. Yeah, if yeah. you put your net in the water one more time, it's you're gonna pull something up. That's good. Yeah, you know, I think I grew, growing up, I, it took me a long time to even realize that God does care about even the simplest things in my life and stuff. Because as a child with my parents, I never felt that they weren't interested because they were so involved in their trauma and all that and I could go away for days wouldn't even be asked you know and so I realized as I got older that I was looking at God that way yeah. you know like you don't care either or you know yeah I think and we're all in yeah so I think a the, lot of it too has to do with how you grew up in your family and how you were treated did you have a mom and dad who did listen to you and were concerned and, and wanted to come through and help you yeah. I think it makes it somewhat easier. It doesn't, you know, you still have to process that with yeah. God, your relationship with him. But yeah, that's a good point. What? Well, I want to read my first journal entry, the one that says a semi-truck of burden. This was, this was, this is my words to him and my pondering how I carry my cares and, and who I believe. Can you feel the vastness of God, how big he is, never ending unlimited capacity? The Father wants us to open our eyes and remember how big he is. Take a moment to try to envision how big he is. Nothing is too big for him. I see a picture of myself trying to drag my burdens and life problems behind me like a giant semi-truck with a rope tied to it. I find myself talked into believing that this is my job. I believe you are God, but I don't know you enough to know that this is not my job, not on a daily basis. What burdens me, I sometimes don't see get resolved, sometimes for years. Do you see me, God? Do you care? Yes, you do. You see me wearing myself out, pulling the semi-truck of my burdens, of others' burdens, and your heart goes out to me. You are constantly inviting me to give you my rope. You invited me to rest under the shadow of your wings. There you have prepared a banquet for me. You fill me with living waters. Here I find light and I live in light. I find life. Maybe it isn't about finding a resolve to everything. Maybe it's about who I'm finding my rest in. It's knowing the goodness of a good God, that you are a big God even before I have understanding or my problems taken care of. You aren't a genie in a bottle for me to rub and ask for three wishes to fix all my problems and give me unending resources. You are a loving, faithful, righteous, and just God. You have a heart to defend me and to protect me. Your unfailing love is priceless. You actually are far greater than that genie because you are like no other. 
So we drop our rope and run to you, believing that what we drop, you won't. You care so much. We run to you and you take care of us. Let's bring what we're dragging to him. Can you see his vastness, his infinite wisdom and loyalty? Our tight grip keeps him moving. What happens when you drop the rope? What does he do? Can you see the smile on his face, the confidence there? He isn't worried or afraid. He is love. He is righteousness. He is almighty over every need, every small care, all the way to the biggest, the most lengthy, the one that seems most impossible. He wants to trade. Will you trade your semi-truck for his shadow of rest, the banquet he has prepared? Eat your fill. He has living waters to fill your tank. And I read Psalm 11 the other day, and it, and this really like resonated with me through when I was rereading through the semi truck of burdens journal entry. And in Psalm 11, David um, writes that he says, "I've already run for dear life straight to the arms of God." So he's telling us that he had a care and a burden, and he runs, he he ran straight to God. So why would I run away now when you say? So these are his friends that have come and, and, and said to him, "Run to the mountains. The evil bows are bent, and the wicked arrows aim to shoot under cover of darkness. And every heart open to God. The bottoms dropped out of the country. Good people don't have a chance." But David says, "But God hasn't moved to the mountains. His holy address hasn't changed. He's in charge." As always, his eyes taking everything in, his eyelids unblinking, examining Adam's flesh and blood inside and out, not missing a thing. And he tests the good and the bad. If anyone cheats, God's outraged. Fail the test and you're out. Out in a hailstone, hail of firestones, drinking from a canteen filled with hot desert wind. God's business is putting things right. He loves getting the line straight, setting us straight. Once we're standing tall, we can look him straight in the eye. And I loved this song because David was like, I've already run to the mountain, and the mountain is God. Quit telling me to do something else. And this is what we do. We give our own wisdom for things, and we have to know that we've run to the mountain, and he is God. And he is not moved, and he knows everything, and he doesn't miss a thing. And David, he wrote this, you know, when, when Saul was trying to kill him. And... He was doing that. He was running to a mountain and hiding. Like this was literal for him. But I've never had somebody running after me trying to murder me. I haven't had that kind of care burden. Really, when I think about what's going on over in Israel and Gaza and all the countries, like yeah. my little cares and burdens look really simple. And I don't know what it's <coughs> like to not have clean water and know where I'm going to sleep and, it, and be cold all the time. Like, I don't have those cares and burdens. And David knew that he could stay firm in God, no matter what anybody was saying. And I feel like that's where God wants me to be and where he wants all of us to be. And it's a, it's a journey. I feel like I'm there some days, and then another, like, wave hits me, and I have to relearn it again. But I have those, those testimonies those times and that's what I have to go back and remember God this you did this and this time you did this and as those pile up my foundation is stronger and I have a place to stand when the next wind hits it's that building your house on a rock versus on the same um, parable so before we run out of too much time here I want to move to our third point I want to talk about now this isn't in the verse I've added this so don't, this isn't First Peter saying, uh, saying this, I'm saying it. Now I can care for others. So once I've learned how to cast my cares and that God cares for me, now I have room to care for others. In First Peter, I read the whole book several times this week, and Peter talks, repeats himself a lot about the fact that we are to love one another deeply from the heart and so we can interchange love and care a little bit because we don't we we can't really care for one another if we don't know what love is because care really caring and he talks about caring and um 
being humble towards one another and submitting to one another has to be done cheerfully. Remember the verse about giving? Like we want to do it cheerfully. God wants a cheerful giver. There is a, an intention and attitude of the heart when we go about something. We can help somebody. Doesn't mean we're doing it with the right attitude all the time. Sometimes we're grudging and we're like, oh yeah, like so-and-so needs my help again. Yeah. Like it's the cheerfulness like of caring for one another because it's what pleases our Father. So Peter talks a lot about the fact that we're to love one another deeply. The whole Bible talks about that, right? Jesus said that was the next to loving God. We are to love one another. So I always think I know what this means. Like, yeah, yeah, I gotta love people. I know what love is. Until I really learn how Jesus loved. And then I'm like, ooh, yikes, I don't love like that. That's hard. I've made up my own decision about what love is. And we know, and we know because of DC Talk, that love is a verb. I just wanted to add that. <laughs> That's when I learned that love was, is a verb. That's, that was like my favorite band in the 90s. Don't put your thumbs down. That's so sad. <laughs> Next but, week, audio drill. <laughs> I don't think I'll go there. But I, we can say that we love each other as many times as we want, but love really is how we act out, like our life with one another. <clears throat> so, um, Jen and I were talking yesterday about the idea of love being made complete. First John 4 talks about God loving us. It's a circle of love. My little circle of love that seems to be the best for me is God loved me first, and then I learned of him and I loved him. And that's my little circle that I'd like to stay in. It's a comfy circle. It's an easy circle. Me and God. That's easy. But God says, no, that's not my circle. That's not what I'm calling. What I've made it to be. I want you to love others. So, to make love complete, we have to love God. He loves us. And then we have to love others with that love. And it's just like a complete circle of love. So when I was thinking through this, these are this is my flow of thoughts I wanted to share with you. So I come to know Jesus, and he begins to pour his love on me, and I begin to transform in his river of love. And my heart blooms from the power of his pure, good, and perfect love. And then I give this love back to him. I can't love without God loving me first. Over and over again, he's pouring in, and I can feel my heart mending my whole self becoming new, and my heart wells up with love, full of thanksgiving and praise, deep, deep gratitude, and a new sense of hunger. I learn his ways of love, that he really cares for me. All that I got used to carrying, I'm learning I can give to him. All the big things, the small things, the embarrassing things, the stupid things. They all matter to him because I matter to him. And I watch him take my stuff and organize it, put it where it belongs, and move it around. He knows and he already knew. This makes me love him even deeper. And he teaches me to put eternal things in the kingdom always in front of my eyes. So with this renewed vision, he begins to bring by hand people into my view, showing me their needs. He asks if I'll lay myself down for them. He's created me in a way that I now understand, and we're all different, is that I feel things. When I'm near you all, I feel your feelings. When I'm in places, I feel feelings. I now understand that I used to feel like I was a mess when I went into crowds or at funerals or different places where feelings were big. Mm -hmm. And now I just realize that I have a gift of feeling people's feelings. And so now I get to ask God what to do with those and how to meet needs. So most of the time I know that part of my partnership with him is intercession for people. But other times it's just setting aside what I wanted, whether it's my money, my time, my, my plans, a resource or a material item, any of these things, and meet another's need. And as I've been putting this into practice, practice and not perfectly, of course, <laughs> I've realized a few things. And here's four of the things I've realized. One, 
I have a lot of comforts that I struggle to be okay with losing. <laughs> it's those ooh moments, like, oh, yeah, I don't want to give up my sleep. Like, just comfort. <laughs> but when we're starting to love one another, God doesn't measure our comforts in to its into meeting a need. Two is I've spent years inside my own cares, so many years inside that spinning of my own cares that I've missed the beautiful freedom and fulfillment of touching someone else's heart. When I meet another's need out of the cheerfulness of my heart that God has led me to do, there is something there mm -hmm. that is contagious and I want to do it again. And number three, God is okay with my struggle. That he loves, it's my heart's intention to say yes to him that he loves. It's really what he really cares about. I'll eventually get to the yes with him because I can't give him my no anymore. But he's okay with my struggles of getting there. And the last one is that I'm not alone. Meeting others' cares yanks me out of that yucky spirit of isolation. <coughs> so Jesus' face is what... I look at when a need is met. When in that show, The Chosen, whenever he healed somebody, there was his face. I couldn't get over his face. And then the music that they put in the show just totally puts it over the top for me. And I'm sitting there stopping. <laughs> because I'm like, I want to know this man. This man that was not afraid to touch a leper, even though all the people were like, What are you doing? And, you know, and then the way that the one that got healed just was melted in his arms. It's just his face is what I see when, it, when a need is met. I want to see his face because my goal is to please him. That's what I want. And that's what he, his goal is for all of us. It's to just, yeah. Like the song Chris was singing, I want to know what makes you smile. I want to know what makes you cry. Like, I, that's what I want to know. And my, my, I was trying to give an example in my life of, of what I've been doing to meet another's need. And I was thinking about my aunt. Mm -hmm. My aunt has Alzheimer's. And she is a lot of work. And she can be really frustrating. <laughs> Even a word, the word annoying sometimes. Because an Alzheimer's patient... They can, especially one that does not want to go along with the process and believe that they're sick, is can be frustrating. And God has asked me, will you take care of my daughter? Will you take care of, she's a widow. And you know, he has a lot of things to say about us taking care of widows. And there, so, I've, so I've been taking her all her medical appointments and all, and anything around that that she needs. And then looking ahead in the future as to there might be more care and more time and will I give my time and I've wrestled with it because I'm like but what am I giving up and but what is my giving to what am I needing a need of and how am I pleasing God's heart and so that's like where I'm looking at all of the things that come up in my life is how am I how what can I do to please you in this even if I have to sacrifice me or a part of me. <coughs> and I feel like a lot of people might take these this out of way context and be like, well, then I can't. Then God's going to take everything from me and make me do meet all the needs of everybody around me. But it's more about being just being led. It's more about like that nudge. Like Holy Spirit's like, will you do this? Will you? Do, will you, you know you want to sit here with me, but will you, I have a word for the person across the room. Like, will you share that word with them? And, like, just simple things sometimes. So I, I want to end with my last little journal writing. It's called a love note. So we're going to end with what I heard God say to me about loving others. And there might be a little other thing. <laughs> he said, my goodness is constantly coming after you, dear one. You can't run from it. You can't hide from it. You can reject it, but I still pour it out. 
It is who I am. I am God. You are my daughter, my darling. Look to see where I am daily chasing you. Look back to catch my goodness. You will fill up many containers with it. Look to me, dear one. Don't accept confusion or an overwhelming feeling to perfectly follow me, to get it all right. Just keep seeking me. Let go of your grip. Get in the word over and over again. Try. Bring your heart every day and offer it up. I am your heartbeat. I am your every breath. I am everywhere you look. Step into confidence of what your prayers carry. Don't be afraid. Be bold and very courageous. See fear when it comes and dash it away. Look to me. You are using your eyes and your ears. The awareness of what I'm saying and doing is increasing. The dial is being turned up for you to understand the supernatural and what is happening around you. Just let go of the worldly worries and the distractions. Stay close to me. You are so very valuable and already accepted by me. When I created you, I already fully loved you. When you arise, I already accept who you are fully, and I love you deeply. When you lay down at night, my heart bursts for you, and I'm so pleased to be your Abba. Do you want to see more of me manifest in your life? Invite me in. Look to me first in everything, even the smallest things. I will not fail you. Speak more. Don't let the world drown out what your heart knows. Don't let fear of man steal what I long to do through you. I have so many opportunities for you to be my hands and feet on earth. The pages of the book are turning. Will you come out with me more? It just takes deciding to stand on me and believe what I say above all others. It just takes obedience. A yes, and I will do all the work. Come on a new journey with me. Look to others' needs and watch me meet yours so abundantly. Love others in extravagant ways and watch how much your life will bloom and smell like me. You have my love all the days of your life. I have a place prepared for you, for you to rest and be filled life in. <clears throat> we will sit together, walk together, talk for long times. You will be you, aware of who you are and aware of who I am. There will be full truth and life to live in, no more deception or darkness. This is the hope you have now and forevermore. My love is yours, my beloved dear one. And I know this was personal to me, but he, this is what he thinks about all of us. This is what he has for us. And if he just wants me to meet a need of someone, to care for somebody else over me, it's what I want to do. And so that's, that's just what I wanted to share tonight. And I know you all know this stuff. It's not new, but it's so good to to just go over it again. And even as I'm sharing it, I'm grabbing new pieces of what God is saying and what he's doing. So I just want to pray for us. And then if Rob will let us, I want to pray for Rob. <coughs> Jesus, we just thank you that you care. There's so many roles that you have. That I just feel that heavy on me that God, you are love tonight. And love covers everything. We just thank you for your presence that you invite us into. We thank you for that. The fact that you want to take the rope of our semi truck and pull and take our burdens to where they belong and put them in order. And then we can just follow you. Just thank you, God, that you want to show us what you want to put on the end of our fishing pole when we cast it to you. I pray that you would make it clear to us that we would eyes to see and ears to hear. I pray that you give us wisdom and revelation so we can know you better. And that we would know your love, how wide and how deep and how high and how long it is. And I know this is the journey we're on through all of eternity to constantly know who the I am is. So we put our hope in you and we look to the kingdom and to eternity and you can bring anybody into our view, God, that you want us to meet a need and we want to partner with you. Whether it's in our homes, in our, in our businesses, in our schools, or right here in this city, God where there's so many needs. We will not be overwhelmed by the needs because you are not overwhelmed by them. 
We just want to step into what you want to do. The plan you have for Dayton is good and it's right. 